But then the fact that God kept killing everybody in their path. Here they, here come them, here, here they come. Here they come. And they're carrying that ark. You remember the story uh, over in Samuel when they went and got the ark? And they brought it into the camp and they shouted? But this time, you know, God taught them a lesson because you can't praise him and you can't worship God superficially. Amen. That time they brought the ark because they were in sin. Right. So they said, they, said, they said, go get the ark of the covenant and bring the ark into the camp. And then when you bring the ark into the camp, let's shout. Yes. So they shouted and the Philistines said, what means this noise? They shouted so loud that the ground started shaking. Right. And the Philistines got scared. Yes. Then all of a sudden, so one of the Philistines said, stand up and fight, be men. And they ended up killing everybody in their path. And they took the Ark of the Covenant with them. You cannot. What is the Bible? The Bible says what? Um, uh, God is not mocked. You cannot. You do, thank you. Be not deceived. But God is not mocked. Whatever you sow, you will reap. The conscience and the heart is under, is under a candlestick to the Lord. That's what the book of Proverbs says. Yeah. God can see. Yes, he can. So you can fake worship if you want to. Amen. You can fool us Amen. to a certain degree because again, you try a spirit by the spirit. Amen. And you can only fool us for so long because the covers is coming back. Amen. And we're going to be able to tell what the real deal is. Amen. We're going to be able to tell what the real deal is after a while. Amen. You stand up in front of God's people long enough Amen. and he will shine the light. <laughs> and you don't want to be caught in that position. You don't want to be caught in that position. If you stand back and look at the world's events, God is pulling the covers back. Yeah. Pulling the covers back off of people. Yeah. Pulling the covers back. And they're exposing a lot of things. That's, and we're like, oh my Lord. I would never have imagined. But he's pulling the covers back. Why? Because why, watch this. God's reputation is worth more to him than yours is. His reputation is worth more than yours. So he will expose you to preserve his reputation. So, set in the atmosphere. They shout with a loud shout and the walls collapse. These great intimidating walls that intimidated them in times past, they collapse on every side. And this, why is this significant? This is a significant uh, military strategy. Why? Because it allowed the children of Israel to attack from every side at the same time. Yes, that's right, sir. Same time. Amen. They go in. He, they, they, what did he say? Shout. Because the Lord has given you the city. This was before the walls even fell down. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we have to find ourselves in a place of obedience. Because when God tells us to do things, more, oftentimes more than not, it's not going to make sense. Amen. Just like you're not going to understand it. Amen. But we need to find ourselves in position of obedience. I can see my, I, I can just imagine a great example and I understand why he's called the father of faith was Abraham. I can just imagine how when God told him, get up, pack up your family, pack up all your things and go. Well, God, where am I going? Don't worry about that. I'll tell you, I'll tell you along the way. Can you imagine some, you wives, wives in here, can you imagine your husband coming to you saying, we got to pack up? What do you mean? <laughs> Pack up. What are you talking about? God said we got to go. Well, where he said we going? I don't know. You have lost your entire mind. I'm not going nowhere. Can you imagine what Abraham had to go through? Can you imagine? Where he had to go to his family and be like, well, we got to go. Where you going? I don't know. You don't know. Well, you let me know when you do know because I'm not going. That's what some of us would say. Because that doesn't make sense. And what level of faith do you have to have for that? What level of faith do you have to have to lay your only son upon an altar? And take a knife and raise it and get ready to kill your only son? And then right when he's in mid-swing, God, stop! Just want to see if you're going to do it. Just want to see if you're what? You wide in here. I got to take, I got to take Johnny. Where are you taking him? To the altar to be slain. We going to jail. They call it CPS. <laughs> Y'all picking up frying pans, all kinds of spatulas and stuff. You be done fr uh, cook some hot grits and try to throw it on us. Why? Because you just that doesn't make sense. God told you to kill our kid. No, He didn't tell you that. You crazy? Can you imagine? 
but obedience. And we are still reaping the blessing of Abraham now because of his obedience. Moving along real quick. I'm almost done. Let's go to Acts chapter 16. This time we're going to read together because there's not that many verses. Everyone have it? Let's read together. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. You may have your seats. Again, setting the atmosphere. We are very, very familiar with this story. Very familiar with Paul and his nature. He was one of the most prolific writers of the New Testament. He was responsible for over two thirds of it. And in this particular uh, text, Paul and Silas have been preaching and, you know, persecuted for the gospel's sake, for the sake of the gospel. And just to uh, keep moving very swiftly through the story, the bottom line is uh, they got thrown in jail. They got thrown in jail. And they got thrown in jail in this particular text because Paul. Uh, you remember uh, they were walking through the city and for a certain amount of time they had this damsel that was following them and she had the spirit of divination, the Bible says. And that's basically back in those times what we call a modern day fortune teller. All right. And Paul basically had gotten to because he, again, we discern the spirit, by we try the spirit by the spirit. He understood what her motive was. And so he turned around and said, come out of her, cast the devil out. Right? So, because he catches the devil out, and because of that spirit, now she can no longer tell the future. So her masters, the Bible says, became upset because their gain was gone. In other words, they was making money off of her. Come on over here, let's remember Miss Cleo? Remember what happened to her? I think she's still in jail. No, <laughs> now that's funny. <laughs> Yeah, I guess you didn't see that coming. <laughs> so they lost their game. So they became upset and had Paul and Silas thrown in jail. All right? Paul and, not only did they have them thrown, it's one thing to be thrown in jail, but it's another thing to be thrown in the inner part of the jail. Don't, but jail is enough. I know for those of us that have ever been inside of a, um, a correctional facility, that's enough. When you hear the yink and the, I, 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 you know, that does something to me every time. I like, no, I can't stay here, I can't. But to be, basically, in our terms, they put, they, they put them under the jail. And they put their feet in stocks. The Bible says. So I'm going to put you on the innermost part of the jail. And I'm going to bind you. Dark situation. So what did they do? They set the atmosphere. The Bible says they begin to sing and pray. They begin to sing and pray. And sing and pray. They could have complained. Which is what some of us would have done. Lord, what I done done now? You know I ain't here. Why am I in here? That's what some of us do. I know I do from time to time. I find myself, when, especially when situations come at you that you have no control over. It's one thing to make a bad decision and reap the benefits of the decision that you made. Because, okay, well, I got to deal with that because that was just a foolish decision. I'm talking about when something blindsides you that you have absolutely no recollection of and no control of. That comes and cripples you momentarily. Yeah. 
Those are the times we find ourselves, again, lack of understanding. Why is this happening to me? And then we find ourselves complaining. We find ourselves almost as uh, Job's wife told him, won't you just curse God? My God. Curse him. My curse God. God and die. It'd be easier for you than to continue on like this. But what do they do? They pray and they say. And they pray and they say. And we just covered earlier that he inhabits the praises of his people. So I was, uh, in my notes, I was looking at this one particular where it said the presence of God came in and that jail wasn't big enough to handle God's presence. So what the Bible says is that the earth began to quake. God came and sat down in the midst of their praise. The earth begins to quake and all of the doors open. This happened simultaneously. Now can you imagine if I'm the jailer and earthquakes back in those times weren't really um, common in that particular area. So the earth begins to quake and the doors open at the same time? Not to, uh, just Paul and Silas' prison. All the doors in the jail open. So that comes to say sometimes your praise will not only free you but it'll free somebody else. you to come into the house of God with a praise on your lips. Sometimes your praise and your worship will liberate somebody next to you. You never know what people are dealing with when they come to the house of God. So if I watch you praise and I watch you worship, that'll liberate me. That'll free me. So, the, the, the and then the jailer, he becomes upset because back in those times, uh, this is we're talking about Roman soldiers now. Now the Romans were professional killers. You see what they did to Jesus. We don't have to go through all that. We just came through Passion Week and Easter. So we all we know about the Roman soldiers. Mm -hmm. But in particular note, uh, they charged the jailer. When, they, when, they, when the Roman soldiers give you a charge, that means you do this with your life. Amen. In other words, the jail, um, the, the uh, prison doors open, and if any of those prisoners would have escaped, they would have killed him. Amen. Because he was responsible for them. Because he was charged. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? And that's why Paul cries out. Do thyself no harm. He's ready to kill himself. Well, I, I might as well off myself rather than subject myself to the Roman soldier because their brothers is nuts. Yeah. Yeah, I see what they did to you. No, I just kill myself. And Paul cries out, I do thyself no harm. We are all here. We're still here. Don't kill yourself. But in the meantime, come over here and let me talk to you. Yeah. And the jailer can say, yeah, right. Go figure. Somebody that's working for the Roman soldiers actually is exposed to the power of God. And it all starts by Paul and Simon setting the atmosphere. Whatever happened to the days where we, where the glory of God rested so in the tabernacle that people from off the street would just wander in? That's what. That's the church that I came up in. We came up in the days where we used to hang crutches and wheelchairs on the wall and walkers on the wall as a testament to God's power. Whatever happened to those days? What happened to those days where we used to? Lay out before the Lord on in all night shut ins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever happened to those days when we would call upon the sick and bring them right up here to the altar, pray the prayer of faith, and watch God move in their life. Yeah. Right then and there on the spot. I'm not talking about two or three weeks. Right there, they would be healed in the service. What happened to the Shekinah glory of God that used to dwell in the Remember when you be in those services and you open your eyes and it almost looked smoky and misty in the church? Whatever happened to those days? Whatever happened to those days when the kind of glory of God would rest in the temple like it did on the mountain when he called Moses up to the mountain? Whatever happened to those days? Those days, the praying mothers of the church. You remember those praying mothers? You remember them? Now, we got, we still got some problems. Not to, that's not to say we don't have any praying mothers left, but our praying mothers now don't have the same liberties as those praying mothers then. We've closed their mouths. Of the praying mother. You, you can't say nothing to nobody no more. Especially the children of this generation. You can't say nothing. You can't say nothing to them. And what's even worse is if you say something to them, then the parents will side with their children. And they're wrong. What made you think that your child was perfect? Your child is a spinoff of you. And you knew you wasn't perfect. So you want to know your child ain't perfect. We can't say nothing to nobody. We can't say nothing to nobody. We can't, you better not correct nobody's child. Because it's going to be a price to pay 
when you reach outside of them doors. I need to talk to you. Don't you ever correct my child. Well, come on. Are you serious? Yeah, go on. The mothers, I don't understand. What's wrong with the children of this generation? What's wrong with the younger parents of our generation? What's wrong with you? You remember the days where we used to send our children outside to play? The whole and then neighborhood. one of the neighbors down the, the street told the kid doing something it. they weren't supposed to do? They would correct your child. Uh-huh. And then bring your child to you. To you so you Tell can get him. Tell what you did. Tell <laughs> them I corrected him for you. And then you get beat all over again. What happened to them days? Still got the mark to prove it. What happened to those days? Now, watch this. Society has predicated to us how we are supposed to raise our children. Never mind that the Bible said, come ye out from among them and be ye separate. How is it that we, the church, the called out ones, the ecclesia, how is it that we have uh, submitted ourselves to the standard of society in raising our children? You ought not do that to your children. Well, I'll pack up all their clothes. Here go their birth certificate and their social security number, and they can come live with you. But as for me and my house, then I have a different standard than you. And for all of us in here who came up under that old school teaching, I don't think none of us turned out too bad. Amen. None of us turned out too bad. Amen. We're in the house of the Lord. Amen. We're in ministry. We're serving the Lord. They put the fear of God in us. And those particular principles and values are absent in this society. All of this ties into worship. Because all of it starts in the home. All of it starts at home. Some of us, I would, Lord, I don't know if I should say it. Some of us, because we're not doing what we need to do in the home, and then we bring our children to the church and expect the church to raise our children. I am not responsible for your child. You are. The church is supposed to be an undergirding support system to what's already occurring in the home. If you're not correcting your children, they will never learn how to deal with authority. Amen. Never learn how to deal with authority. Amen. And when they grow up, they because you didn't teach them how to uh, deal with authority, they will disrespect you Amen. when they get older because they don't know how to respect authority. Amen. And then you co-sign with them because when they got corrected, when they were wrong, then you sided with them because you thought your child was being picked on. So then you close the mouth of the prophet when you come into the house of God. And you the Bible already told you, muzzle not the ox that treadeth out the corn. But you close up the mouth of the prophet when he comes into the house to be corrected because you can't receive correction because you're not correcting him at all. They go to school doing whatever they want to do. Then they come home and do whatever they want to do. We let BET and the social networks and everything else raise our children. What happened to the days when we all sat at the table and ate dinner together? Amen. What happened to them days? We couldn't watch TV during dinner. Turn the TV off. Amen. Turn your phone off. Back then, matter of fact, I didn't have a cell phone. But I didn't get a phone until I was grown. And I was able to afford it on my own. My parents wouldn't buy me no cell phone. I know, I understand that times have changed. So I'm not condemning the fact that children have cell phones now. But I'm, 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 I am saying that we as parents ought to have some kind of uh, wisdom and supervision and oversight not to allow these things to become gods to our children. The cell phone is to God and the BET, the MTV Cribs and whatever else they watch now. And the PSPs and, and the Playstations and the Xboxes and whatever else that they into now. Those are their gods. Because we as parents are failing to pass along the principle. Would it uh, I'm reminded of the story where, um, when uh, the children of Israel came over the river Jordan with Joshua and they took up them 12 stones out of the river yeah, yeah, yeah. and God told them to put the stones in the camp and then leave them as a memorial to remember. So when the children come up and they come to you and say, what mean ye these stones? They can say, this is a memorial that God brought us over. Yeah. And you can use that as a segue to introduce them to the God of our Father. But we're not passing down those principles and values to our children. That's why they, they've gone astray. That's why you can't tell them anything now. All of this, has it, what does this have to do with worship? Everything. 
Because worship starts at home. Amen. Starts at home. And if we, truth be told, if we bring some of these things into order in our personal lives, that will cut down on the confusion that we have in common before we get here. Before we get here. Because the enemy's job is what? Kill, steal, destroy. Come to distract. His job is to get you to feel about God the way he does. You see what happened to him? He was cast out of heaven as a light to the earth. And ever since then, his job is to get you to feel about God the same way he does. So what does this mean to the modern day worshiper? It means that we have to align ourselves with the will of God. Align ourselves with the plan of God. As it relates to our respective houses and our leaderships and different things like that. But it's all about the mind. That's why Paul tells us in the book of Romans chapter 12 to renew our minds. That you may prove what is that good and perfect will of God. The battle is won or lost in your mind. Period. Point blank. You will never. What we do, our actions are only outward manifestations of what's taking place in your mind first. So if, you lie, if you're wayward in your thinking in your mind, it's going to manifest. If you're thinking about other things than what you should be thinking about while you're in church, it's going to manifest itself. It will manifest itself. Because while everybody else is in worship, you'll be... Or you busy. Because your focus is wrong. Focus just off. Then we wonder, why well, I wonder why God don't move in services like he used to. Because we're not all one accord. We're not unified. And he can't. He wants to. We have enough word to validate the fact that he wants to. He wants to be with the son. He wants to be with his people. But we have to set the atmosphere. Atmosphere that is inviting for him to come in. Because until the atmosphere is right, he's not coming. Into our services. Until the atmosphere is right, he's not coming into our homes. Until the atmosphere is right, until our focus, we have set our mind in a particular direction to make him the center of our attention. And everything that comes with it, whether we understand him or not. I pray that the Lord has blessed what I've said so far. And uh, we're going to turn it back into the hands of. Overseer College. Amen. Let's stand here and receive Overseer College.